Hello, I'm Dr. Ailey Kalapilla from Emory University. In this National HIV Curriculum mini lecture, I'm going to provide you with a brief review on the prevention or prophylaxis of pneumocystis pneumonia in people living with HIV. This is going to be the outline of my talk. I'll start with background and rationale, then we'll follow it up with current recommendations for pneumocystis prevention, including criteria for starting and stopping prophylaxis. We'll then discuss medications used for pneumocystis prophylaxis. We'll then talk a little bit about medication side effects, and then finally, a summary. Now let's dive right into background and rationale. So pneumocystis pneumonia, which I will refer to as PCP, is a major cause of pneumonia in people living with HIV whose CD4 count is less than 200. PCP is caused by pneumocystis gyrovecchiae, which is a ubiquitous organism that has been classified as a fungus. PCP spreads by the airborne route with disease occurring either by new acquisition of infection or by reactivation of latent infection. Symptoms seen with PCP pneumonia include fevers, dry cough, dyspnea, and hypoxic respiratory failure. Now, let's get into some details on the prevention of PCP. The adult and adolescent OI guidelines have listed the following criteria as indications for initiating PCP prophylaxis to prevent active infection. These include a CD4 count less than 200, or a CD4% less than 14%, or a CD4 count greater than 200 but less than 250 if antiretroviral therapy is delayed and frequent CD4 monitoring is not feasible. Note that if a patient is receiving treatment for toxoplasmosis infection with sulfur-containing drugs, then additional PCP prophylaxis is not required. So these are your medication options for primary prophylaxis to prevent PCP pneumonia. The first-line regimen that should ideally be used is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which I will refer to as trimsulfa, and the preferred dosing is to take one double-strength tablet once daily. Now note that this is the same dose that we've used for toxoplasma prophylaxis when the CD4 count is less than 100. So this is actually quite convenient that trimsulfa provides prophylaxis against both PCP and toxoplasmosis. Alternative dosing for trimsulfa include taking a single strength tablet once a day or taking a double strength tablet three times a week. Now there are several other alternative regimens for individuals who are intolerant of trimsulfa. One group of regimens contain dapsone, either taken by itself or in combination with pyrimethamine and leucovorin. Now, you can review the exact dosages by referring back to the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines or to the National HIV Curriculum OI Prevention Module. Remember here with regard to dapsone that you should check a G6PD level prior to administering dapsone. Because if you give dapsone to someone who has G6PD deficiency, you can induce a hemolytic anemia. Another class of alternative regimens used for PCP prophylaxis contain atovoquone. You can take atovoquone by itself, or you can take it with pyrimethamine and leucovorin. In general, though, any regimen that contains pyrimethamine, either the dapsone-containing regimen or the atovacone-containing regimen, is going to be a more expensive regimen, and this is actually driven by the high cost of pyrimethamine in the United States. Finally, aerosolized or inhaled pentamidine is an option for PCP prophylaxis. It is conveniently dosed once monthly, but it is contraindicated in persons with underlying reactive airway disease or pulmonary disease. It does penetrate poorly to the peripheral regions of the lung, and it must be administered in a clinic or a hospital setting using a special RespiroGuard 2 nebulizer. Now, these primary prophylactic PCP regimens can be discontinued if the patient is on combination antiretroviral therapy and has a sustained rise in their CD4 count, to greater than or equal to 200 for at least three months after the initiation of antiretroviral therapy. You can also consider discontinuing prophylaxis for individuals with a CD4 count between 100 and 200, provided the patient is on combination ART and has achieved viral suppression for at least three to six months. 
So there may be situations when you have discontinued the PCP prophylaxis, but then it needs to be restarted again. These are the indications for when to resume prophylaxis. So the first is that the CD4 drops to less than 100. PCP prophylaxis needs to be resumed then for patients, regardless of whether or not they have viral suppression. Prophylaxis also needs to be restarted for individuals with a CD4 between 100 and 200 if they have a detectable HIV viral load. Okay, now let's go over some potential side effects associated with medications used for PCP prophylaxis. So with trim sulfa, some of the potential side effects that you can see include renal dysfunction, hyperkalemia, leukopenia, especially neutropenia. You could see a rash or hepatitis or transaminitis. With dapsone, you can get a hemolytic anemia if given to someone with a G6PD deficiency. Also note that dapsone contains a sulfa moiety. So if an individual has a severe reaction to trim sulfa, like Stephen Johnson's, for example, then you should not be using dapsone for them. However, if an individual has a milder reaction to trim sulfa, like for instance, maybe renal dysfunction or a leukopenia, especially a neutropenia or a mild hepatitis, then you can certainly try dapsone in those individuals. Aerosolized or inhaled pentamidine can cause a cough or a bronchospasm. Atovaquone does not actually have a lot of major side effects, but the biggest complaint that patients have is that it tastes bad. And pyrimethamine can cause some nausea and vomiting, and also you can see bone marrow suppression if it is not co-administered with leucovorin. Finally, let's review some key points regarding PCP prophylaxis. In people living with HIV, pneumocystis prophylaxis or PCP prophylaxis is indicated when the CD4 count is less than 200. The preferred drug to be used for PCP prophylaxis is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Alternative regimens include dapsone, administered by itself or with pyrimethamine and leucovorin, or atovacone, which can be administered by itself or in combination with pyrimethamine and leucovorin, or aerosolized pentamidine. Remember to always check a G6PD level prior to using dapsone to avoid the risk of hemolytic anemia. Dapsone does have a sulfa moiety, so if the patient is intolerant of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, your ability to use dapsone depends on the severity of their reaction to trim sulfa. If it is a severe reaction, it is best to avoid dapsone use, but if the reaction is mild, then you can use dapsone. Finally, you should continue prophylaxis until the patient has achieved immune reconstitution on antiretroviral therapy. The production of this National HIV Curriculum Mini Lecture was supported by grant U10HA32104 from the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the University of Washington IDEA program and do not necessarily represent the official views of HRSA or HHS.